Atrun. Man, so the the three weeks in Laos, Thailand, and South Korea were it was a blast. But uh, I mean, I, I before my departure, it, it was in the mid '80s during the daytime, and here I am coming back, and it's 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 winter time. I mean, I I, I literally it skipped fall. I mean, that's that's essential part of you. So with a, such a short window, how do our tropical fruit trees handle it? I mean, if you've noticed it, I mean, the deciduous trees, the jujubes, they are going deciduous, of course, uh, and losing all their leaves. This is expected. Uh, <laughs> and in its place, it's a bunch of fruits, which I will be picking up. One of the, the best tasting jujubes. But beyond that, beyond the... Um, the five or six deciduous fruit trees that I've got, everything else is evergreen. Everything else that I've got in my yard is evergreen. Uh, I mean, they will remain evergreen basically year round. If you if you look at the Inga, I mean that, that's that's new growth on the Inga. Yeah, one once your tropicals are somewhat established, once it's in the ground, or once you once it's hit a couple of years worth of winter, they're generally fine. They, they, they acclimate easily. Even seedlings, like look at this volunteer chair moya. I mean, it, it's doing great. Even some of the more ultra sensitive tropicals. Let me show you. <laughs> Tamarind tree. I mean, for a long time, I, I thought this guy died. I mean, it, it it was uh you know it was like about this height uh a year or two ago and i mean i i thought it died but no it made a good comeback <laughs> and generally right around this time in, in previous years i've noticed right around november the the foliage would get burnt by the, the, the coal but no not this year i mean yeah i mean tropicals they i mean if you notice it, it i don't really see any issues with the coal uh, on that particular guy. I mean, it's it, it's made a pretty good comeback. Granted, it is having start from scratch again this year. Uh, I mean, it, it really died down to the roots. Again, I thought it died, died. I actually pruned the roots. I mean, I actually pruned it down to the trunk thinking it died, uh, but it made a good comeback. But th that's really a good example of trees somewhat acclimating to the environment. I mean, the, the more exposure they have with our climate, the hardier they'll become. I mean, it, it's just one of those things. Uh, you know, same with papaya. I mean, I'm, I mean, if you look at the fruits, I'm, I'm going to just leave all my papaya fruits here, let them overwinter. And I mean, papayas, the, the fruits, they, they, do, they taste great even after winter. Uh, another jujube that's, uh, of course, going deciduous um i know i've mentioned this already but it, there is a reason why i've got it in front of everything else because this guy can take the sand sand with the other jujube over there during winter time it's gonna all the leaves are gonna fall which would mean all the sunlight then gets cast to the other tropical such as the mango here which it will appreciate so that's the strategy and summertime of course because of the foliage it actually will provide shade to the tropicals including the cherimoya back there i mean that guy can appreciate some shade so winter time you get the maximum sun back there summertime you get the maximum shade so it's it's a, it makes a great companion tree to uh to the others Guava, Thai guava. I mean, I, I really do need to take the time to uh, really come and take out the, the fruits, I mean, the flowers. It is literally still flowering. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I do need to take the time to take that out. But, and, and the reason why I want to do that, the reason why you want to do that is really right now, being that it's in, it, it's, it's in the wintertime. You do not want the tree to produce any fruits or flower. Uh, it, it really should be in survivor mode. 
uh, including, um, you know, like these fruits right here. These are fully ripe, so I'm going to be picking them up. Uh, oh, this, set, this one fell. Yeah, well, this one might be a bit too uh, beyond edible, but still good. Um, yeah. <laughs> so everything seems to be doing okay. I'm I'm not seeing a whole lot of damage, even though when you look at the my yard, which I've got plenty of temperature sensors throughout my yard, the Central Valley is when you when when people say USDA Zone Nine B, it really is the Central Valley. I mean, we, I mean, most other places, I mean, we'd be lucky if, if our nights are in the 40s. Uh, or our nights are typically in the mid to low 30s. Sustained every single night. And I mean, that, that, that's what our topical fruit trees are having to deal with. And for the most part, they're, they're fine. I mean, the red lady papayas, literally, virtually no frost issues. And uh, also back here, I know I keep emphasizing on these, but store fruits, yeah, I mean, these guys are champs. If you look at it here, I mean, there's just really like no way that I'm going to be eat, able to eat all of these once they mature up. I mean, these guys are like crazy productive. There's two trees. These guys are just crazy productive. Uh, let me see if I can grab one for you. Kind of show you the size. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. So, so much so that if you look at the ground, I mean, <laughs> all the mature ones, ripened ones just fell just because there's just no way that we can eat these in, in time. I mean, like, it, look at this. I mean, it's almost like a, uh, an infestation of fruits. <laughs> That's crazy. But um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'm going to take you to the back where I've got a, a few more examples to show you. So here's the backyard. So as you can see, I mean, the deciduous trees, uh, <laughs> the jubis, and even the golden sweet apricot is practically defoliated. So now, I know I've mentioned this before, but for your deciduous trees, um, yeah, now is a good time to stop watering them. Uh, so in, in my case, I did actually turn off all the water. So what you see here really is just from the recent rain that we had. Uh, but of course, the other trees that aren't deciduous, the evergreens, uh, of course, I, I still have the water, but just at the bare minimum, just enough to keep them alive. Uh, because what water does is, of course, is it's going to try to, well, anytime you, you water and fertilize a tree, it, it will try to grow, which you do not want. You want them to kind of go into survivor mode. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's some, <laughs> there's some, you know, stress with the coal, uh, especially this younger papaya. However, I'm not too concerned about it just because when you look at it, I mean, you do see it trying to bounce back. So this set of papaya was the set that uh, was, first of all, just about a month ago, was being burnt by the sun. The leaves are all bleached up. And now the additional stress of the coal. So it, it's got a uh, double whammy happening, but I'm, I'm not too concerned. I mean, the, the, like the mangoes. I mean, it, it's, yeah, these guys are great. <laughs> the, the whole goal really is once all these trees are established, like this Inca here, I mean, you're not going to have an issue with the cold anymore, the frost. That, that, that's really a whole idea. I mean, it, it really does get better e after each year. Um, so now, you know, I just wanted to really share this with you. This is why I like to keep my fruits on the tree for as long as possible. It is, it is just the maximum amount of sugar that um, this tree can get 
being put into the fruit. I mean, this is, it's a white sapote. Yeah, that is as sweet as it can be. But um, wanted to um, show you though. <laughs> so during my absence in Southeast Asia, my heater had malfunctioned in my greenhouse behind us. And uh, unfortunately, that is where all my ultra sensitive tropicals are. Uh, I mean, I was pretty sure that uh, a lot of them, you know, would have been goners. Uh, but surprisingly, a lot of them are still alive, including the rambutans and including the durian. So the temperature had actually reached down to about 33 degrees or so. That was the lowest at one point, according to the sensor that was in the greenhouse, of course. Uh, again, unheated greenhouse. Each, when, when I looked at the historical data, each night it, it was in the mid to low 30s. I mean, yeah, these things shouldn't even survive in, in that climate. But uh, let me show you though, in fact, let me just uh, show you the aftermath, if you will. So yeah, again, <laughs> my, uh, the heater had malfunctioned and of course it, uh, it stopped running. And this is really the, the aftermath. These are uh, chimetos. Um, yeah, this one is uh, not very happy looking. But then the durian uh, right here. Let me see if I can focus a bit for you. But anyhow, this durian, it is actually still very much alive. Sam, well, of course, this other durian, it, it, as you can see, it is <laughs> very, very uh, green. So, um, Sam would like some of these uh, rambutans. Uh, I don't know if this durian is going to make it or not, but he was green. Uh, but if you <laughs> look at everything else, it's, uh, it, it's uh, I mean, again, you know, mid-30s to low-30s. These are... They all seem to be okay. Kaimitos, of course. Uh, the biggest shocker, of course, is the centaur. I mean, this guy, uh, the leaves turning red like this, uh, it, that's, this is cold stress. Uh, but everything else seems to be doing great. Uh, Pendant, of course, it smells really good. But he's still very much alive. I uh, even the ooh, uh, even the Miley apple here. Uh, I I see some cold stress on him. Uh, you could tell by the foliage. I mean, notice he's not very vividly green compared to say like this one that's not stressed out. But he's very much alive. Even the Rambutan that I've got in the ground. I mean, it, it's his buddy is eh, not happy, but the one that's in the ground is doing a far better than the one that's in the container, of course. Uh, I mean, when in the ground, you know, you've, you've got the, the help of the microorganisms and more importantly, the geothermic effect of the earth. I mean, trees, unlike mammals, you and I, they do not have any eternal warmth they don't produce any heat so instead uh, i mean the trees are having to really rely on the earth for for warmth uh, and the sun of course but uh yeah i'm i'm really impressed that uh much of my trees are still alive even in this unheated greenhouse for you know three weeks <laughs> that, that, that's when i've noticed that uh, it uh, had malfunction uh, but beyond that, I mean, I'm even just jackfruit. I, I see really no issues with it.
I mean, there's, well, let me take care of that. I see some coarse dress with it, but it, it's very much alive, of course. Yeah, I mean, I'm really surprised at, at the cohortiness of some of these tropical fruit trees. I mean, you know, it, it's been reported that mango trees start dying out when they're when it's in the mid 30s uh, and 40s, but not mine. I mean, look at all the seedlings. Yeah, these are some of the mangoes that. Uh, you know, I, I just could not find uh, anywhere in the local nursery. So the only way for me to grab them or to get them or just do um, seed propagations. I mean, these are, you're talking like the, uh, uh, I want to say, let me see what this one is. Uh, that's a Damnok Mai. Uh, this is a Ketamon, yeah. Uh, <laughs> smells really good. <laughs> But anyhow, yeah, I'm, I'm really surprised that, I, again, most of these, they seem to be doing okay. So let me uh, get out of the greenhouse here. So, yeah, let me just kind of really take you to the, the yard. I mean, everything is looking good. I mean, there's... Store food here is doing okay. Red Israel Etamoya, self pollinating uh, Etamoya. It's doing great. I mean, even the new growth is not impacted by the, the coal. I mean, granted, we've got two more months. I mean, this is just month one of three months of winter. I mean, it, in our area, it normally doesn't start warming up until March or so. Uh, when I say warm up, as in the threat of frost is gone. Usually that ends in March. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, yeah, so it, it so the, the idea behind trying to grow your tropical fruit trees uh, really is doing the growing months, basically months that are not December, January, or February, you've got those nine months to really fatten them up to to train them to to be as resistant as possible and then those three months uh is really the true test uh of their survival in in the cold climate i think i see a sonam cherry here not quite ripe but i'm still gonna eat it but yeah <laughs> so it, it, it it's it's uh to me, it's, it's, it's a lot like the Olympics. You know, you, you train and train and train, and then you've got those few weeks that you want to showcase your skills and talents. Except in the case of tropical food trees, those three months uh, is really dedicated to just surviving and, and not dying. <laughs> uh, and so far, everything seems to be looking awesome. So, yeah, anyhow. Oh, you know what? Before I forget, quick comparison. This is uh, kind of unrelated, but so while in Laos, there were a couple of canistel trees, uh, egg fruit plants. This is <laughs> what you get when, when growing them in their, their non-native climate compared to their native climate. This kind of tail that I've got here is approaching four years old. There was a canistel tree that I saw in Laos uh, that was three years old, but it was producing ton of fruits and it was reaching a height of, I would guess, to be about 20 foot or so. So in our climate, because of the harsh uh, climate, you're never going to really the trees are never going to reach their full potential, but they still will fruit. <laughs> That's the important thing. Which, being that the trees are somewhat miniature size, isn't really a bad thing. Because when you look around me, I mean, like how many trees do you see around me? There's, I would say there's, well, there's... Just surrounding me, I would say there's about maybe a dozen or so trees. 
that's what you get. That's one of the benefits of growing tropical fruit trees in a climate is they are naturally going to be smaller than their native counterpart, which would mean you can get a lot in a small confined space. They still will produce fruits. Um, but yeah, that, that's one of the, the benefits, I guess, is, you know, you, you, you're able to get a lot of trees uh, in a small area just because they, they will naturally get knocked down just a bit with the climate. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's really it. <laughs> so, so far, no downside impacts. Well, very minimal. Uh, I'm just not seeing a whole lot of severity with the, the, with, with, by the frost. Um, unlike, <laughs> unlike my fishes, which I will share with you. Uh, so there's a couple of, there's two heaters that I've got in there. Uh, there was an electrical outlet that essentially got overloaded uh, with all the greenhouse fans that I've got going on and the heaters that essentially caused the electrical outlet to go out. And this is the result. Um, let me see if I can, actually, right there. I had to uh, unfortunately scoop them out. See all that right there? Uh, that's a lot of dead fishes. So basically yeah, all my tropical fishes in my pond uh, died. No survivors, unfortunately. So yeah, fishes are not even in San Ligas trees. Trees, these trees have been evolved to stay in one place and handle the climate, whatever climate it, it, you, you throw at it. And for the most part, regardless of the tropical fruit trees, they all seem to be doing great. I like fishes. But <laughs> then again, fishes, different kingdom. Yeah, I mean, I have a high level of confidence that uh, everything will work out. I mean, the Cherimoyas are looking as good as they can get. Um, even the guava which I need to take out. So yeah, even the Cavendish banana, um, it's doing okay. So anyhow, all right, have a good afternoon.